Well, good morning. Oh, first of all, let me let me say again. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, most of you know that uh, our family had I don't know one or two issues on the way here, and uh, again, I just want to say uh, thank you from the bottom of our heart. You were so encouraging. I, at one point, Kara uh, turned to me. She's like, "I got to meet these people." Because you had encouraged us, and we, we don't know who you are, <laughs> uh, but there was just so much encouragement and prayer, and, and we, we just, we felt the love of God, and so uh, thank you for that, and that is how the people of God are to be, it's, you know, it's just uh, humbling to be on the receiving end of it, um, so thank you again, and thank you to Pastor Keith for hosting and organizing and all this. Um, I have the privilege of closing our time together. Now, why have we gathered over the last three days? Well, it's on this really nice sign, by the way. Um, you know, gospel-centered, recovering our clarity, renewing our passion, right? You know, we, we're wanting this reminder, and so over the last three days, you know, like, like the Galilean Christians, we too need to recover our clarity. We too need to renew our passion, for the gospel, and, and I pray, because this isn't supposed to just stay here, right? And I pray to share that passion and clarity for the life-saving and transforming gospel to those God has put in your lives, right? Because we all have our specific circle of people. No one else touches other people's lives like you do. God has set that up. Are you now going to take that clarity on the gospel and that passion to them. So, if we can grasp this, renew this, you know, maybe our, our heart and our voices can sound, well, sound like John Newton's most famous hymn, right? He, his, his song, Amazing Grace, spills with wonder and amazement, amazing grace, over what God has done you know, not, not just in the church, not to people, no, to Him, how God changed Him. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we pray that You would, by the power of Your Holy Spirit, enlighten our minds. Lord, we see these scriptures, but everyone can read your word and not be changed. But Lord God, we pray by the power of God that you would transform our hearts. We pray by the power of God that you would give us insight, uh, by the Holy Spirit that you have placed into every single child of yours, um, that, that you would open up our minds and our hearts um, and pray that you have been faithful in doing that over the last few days. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of just being able to go through your word, to hear such variety of speakers on the one true word that stands the test of time and will save us for all time. Be with us, Lord. In your name, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Well, if you're not already in Galatians 6, and, you know, why are, why are you not? Uh, please turn there. Uh, just comes right after Edgar. Man, that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, now, we're going to zero in. I, I couldn't do the whole chapter. I wanted to, but we are going to zero in on Paul's conclusion. We're going to zero in on the end. And we're going to zero in because Paul, he's taught every single bit of this. And so you're gonna, you might be wondering, well, why, why is Pastor Garth repeating a few things? Well, because but through the Holy Spirit, God wanted the Galatians to know, okay, what are, those, what are the key things out of what Paul has just said to us? What do we, what do we need to grab at the end? Well, you know, what do we need to focus on? And, and we're no different, right? Actually, one of the things that I hope to do a little bit today is for us to realize the Galatians are just like us. They, they were just like us. Sure, 2,000 years ago, 
Maybe they, they didn't have Camrys and indoor plumbing, but their hearts are the same. Their problem with sin is the same. Their struggles to stay faithful, to work through the Word of God, to be a community of God together, well, that's the same. There, there is no difference. And these are the same brothers and sisters, the ones who are faithful, that we will see again in glory, right? And so I want you to know that these are very real people. Yes, God has gotten Paul to write this so that Christians of all time, and that means right now, you know, can benefit from it, but there's a heart of Paul for people that I want you to see because the heart of Paul has been written there so that we can realize this actually is the heart of God, breaking over his people. Now, we heard in chapter 1, right, verse 6, Paul, Paul is astonished. The heart of God is astonished that these churches in the Roman province of Galatia, northern Turkey today, you know, that they're so quickly deserting Jesus, right? They're abandoning the very same one who freed them, saved them by his grace. And they're leaving it for it another gospel. Yeah, it's got Jesus' name kind of tagged onto it. But it's a false gospel that, well, it doesn't rely solely on Christ's work on the cross, which means it's a gospel that doesn't save. It's not a gospel at all. And so in this very personal letter, because Paul founded some of these churches, God shared the gospel with groups of people like we're doing now, but Paul also like we do, was probably sitting down knee to knee, leading some of these people he's writing to, right? Eye to eye, leading them through the gospel, seeing the Lord grab them through the power of the Holy Spirit, coming to salvation, and now, years later, these people that healed him while he was sick, that he sweat over, that he with every ounce of his energy while he had none because he was desperately sick as they cared for him, but sharing the gospel because he was growing to love them. These are the same people that he's writing to now. So this letter is with heart. And, and a lot of people today will talk about Paul like he's some kind of cold, woman-hating guy, right? I don't know if you've heard that, but you know, it's, that, that's a short form. Um, I, it, like, there's a lot of that and, that, and that's from Christian circles. And I've had the pleasure of preaching Ephesians and First and Second Thessalonians and being able to spend a lot of time in Galatians. And oh my goodness, this guy's a pastor. He is desperately in love with his people. And when they go astray, his heart breaks and aches. And so, I want you to hear these, this summary you know, why are you saying the same thing again, Paul? Because these are the things I, I, I want you to grab at the end. Because I want you to be with Christ and not be fooled to go another way. Don't let the false teachers take you away from Christ. Uh, Galatians 4 verse 8, you know, he said, you know, formerly when you didn't know God. You were enslaved, right? You, you, you were enslaved. Do you remember that time to those that by nature are not gods? But now that you have come to know God or rather to be known by God. You know, how in the, how can you, how, <laughs> right? You can always hear that. You know, maybe his voice is breaking like mine just did. You know, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? <laughs> really? That's, like you, you were made free, you know, and you observe these days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored in vain. Because they're giving up what Jesus was so clear about. John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you want freedom, if you want to be able to have purpose on earth, if you want to make sure that everything you do, being a father, working at your job, you know, you know, working for things, influencing others, 
You know, whatever you happen to do, if you want that to have eternal purpose, because all that stuff burns away, right? But it actually doesn't when it's done for the glory of God, when it's done to serve Christ first and thereby serve everyone that you're touching and working for. You know, it, if that's, you know, if you don't do that, well, then it's all a waste. It's all a waste. Don't go that route again. So why do churches, why do we, let's make it personal, why do we fall for, you know, we, we call it workspace religion, or on the other side, the, the, the nebulous spirituality, you know, God, you know, we heard, you know, God the grandpa, you know, Jesus is my best friend, um, you know, kind of stuff. You know, why do, we, why do we go one way or the other? Why are we just as prone as these real Galatian Christians who have gone before us to, to be tempted towards really no gospel at all? Well, think about Paul's warning to his protege, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. The time is coming, Paul warns Timothy. The time is coming when people will not endure, and that's the word I'm going to focus on, when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myth. And so, why do you and I, and I definitely need these too, yeah. I've already said, who cares if I'm a pastor? I'm just a guy. God's called me to a certain role, but it, it's no different than a mechanic in serving the, the glory of the Lord, right? It's, it's, we're all equal. You know, so why do I, why do you need weekends like this to be reminded of being gospel-centered? <sighs> because God's teachings are hard. <laughs> you know, God's teachings are hard. They have to be endured. The true gospel doesn't tickle our ears. Think about that. God's gospel, because in his warning, you know, there's times when people are not willing to endure, which means at all times, we always have to endure God's word, because it goes so contrary to our selfish desires, our past selves, you know, what we want. It's so, it's almost like we have to wade through mud. Well, it's even worse than that, Ultimately, it's actually what it means is we need the power of the Holy Spirit, because we can't do it on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to keep us true to God's Word, because it is so hard to endure. It tells us what we don't want to know. It tells us to do what we don't want to do, unless, of course, we already belong to Jesus Christ, and we have been transformed, and we are amazed by His love and the work on the cross, and Paul, well, you know, Romans 5, verse 3 and 4, Paul says, you know, we rejoice in our sufferings. What? We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing, and this is a Holy Spirit-produced thought. This is not a worldly thought. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Well, that, that's all done by God. You can't do that on your own. It's so hard to endure the hard truths of God because it takes God to be able to do it. You know, our, our culture, you know, you've, you've heard this kind of splattered around in, in some of the various sermons today, but you know, um, you know, live your best life now, really? Or does God promise that his followers are going to suffer on earth? You know, I, I've read through the New Testament uh, a few times now, and he does say, by coming to Christ, you're going to have hope and joy, and, and there's a number of things that can go well for you while on this earth, but the only thing God seems to guarantee will happen on this earth is that you will suffer like his son will, has suffered, that they will hate you because they hated the son. And so, that's part of the deal. There is no such thing as living your best life now, you know, that, and that phrase is like 30 years old, except I still hear it used all the time, so it's, it's not out of date. You know, love is love is love. You know, that, that's used in a number of different ways, but um, I actually hear it probably just as much from so-called Christian churches as I do from the world. It really, it just means love is anything you want it to be, granted as long as the culture approves, right? <laughs> you know, it's very flexible, kind of. Or maybe... 1 John 4, 8, God is love, because God, and so God defines love. 
One of those definitions, John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends, which is exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. Or trust in your heart, follow your heart. Really? Uh, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick or wicked, depending on your translation. Don't trust in your heart. It leads you to darkness and it leads you to hell. All right, so let's face it. God does not tell us what we want to hear, at least from a human standpoint. And so we need to endure sound teaching. And so Paul, you know, let's get back to Galatians. (laughs) I should start my sermon at some point, right? So Galatians 6, verse 11. So Paul has this phrase to kind of wake people up. So this is kind of the first point. Paul starts by saying, hey, pay attention. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Now, granted, some people said, well, you know, maybe this is because Paul was blind. He had to write large letters, but that doesn't tell us the purpose. Like, really, was he telling the Galatians, hey, by the way, you know, my, my eyes aren't very good, and so this is why I'm writing to you. And ba-. No, no, no. The purpose. Why, why would Paul write this? I'm writing with, a, with large letters. How many of you have gotten those delightful texts or social media or email, uh, you know, posts of one kind or another from your boss or family, and they use all caps for the whole thing. What does that mean? It means they're shouting at you, right? Okay, so Paul, this is the kind of the idea. Paul is saying, hey, throughout this letter I've been teaching and defending and highlighting and, and, and trying to disciple you and discipline you in some ways, and so now I'm writing in large letters, Make sure you don't miss this. Second point, verses 12 to 14. I want to read that section again. Uh, Paul says, it is, uh, it is those who want, this is talking of the false teachers that's fooled them, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they might not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you uh, circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. All right, and so what's, what's Paul's point in these three verses? Don't add to the cross. Don't distract from the cross. Don't boast about anything else but the cross. Don't add to the cross. Don't distract from the cross. Don't boast about anything but the cross. So verse 12, Paul, Paul's already described some of the, the qualities of the false te- teachers that have been troubling or tricking the Galatians, right? If Galatians 3, verse 1, O foolish Galatians, because anyone is a fool that leaves the wisdom of God. That's a biblical term, actually, f- to, to be a fool. It's why it's such a horrible term, because a fool is someone that does not look to the wisdom of God, does not look to see, uh, seek the wisdom of God. And so, oh foolish Galatians, oh Galatians who are seeking wisdom apart from God, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Christ Jesus was public, per, publicly portrayed as crucified. Verse 3, are you so foolish having begun, having Begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? And so Paul's just saying, you know, once you, you knew, once you understood, once you believed through the power of the Holy Spirit, you understood Christ was crucified. He, he suffered and he died for your sins, for my sins. And not only that, but you suffered for that. People were against you. Um, in, in whatever way, but you, you experience suffering by saying, no, I live through the power and work of Jesus Christ through the cross, and you suffered for that. And many Christians today do as well. Many Christians today do as well. But now who has bewitched them? Well, back to uh, Galatians 12, right? Uh, 6 verse 12. Well, it's those who want to make a good showing of the flesh. What was that? What's that mean? Who here knows what an influencer 
is. Yeah, that delightful term, right? You know, people on TikTok and YouTube and Instagram and, and you know, all those streaming services, right? You know, they, they want to show you how great their lives are or they have a captivating story, right, that then allows them to plug various goods and services um, or, you know, they want your clicks, they want your subscribes and likes, they want to make, they either want to make money off of us or they want to influence us, right? So now, 2,000 years ago, the influencer... <laughs> issue was circumcision, you know, and that's been covered a lot over the last few days, so I'm actually not going to dive into that that much. But uh, the issue basically was, and you have heard it, I think, every sermon, Jesus plus, right, Jesus plus circumcision. You need Jesus plus the law. Uh, you, the issue is Jesus' work on the cross, yeah, it's not quite enough to save you. Jesus isn't quite sufficient to solve your sin problem, the fact that you're going to die and face a holy judge that's going to condemn you for your sin. You know, he's almost sufficient, but not quite. Now, isn't that what we hear, you know, in different ways, of course, in today's culture? Uh, Many progressive churches and other cultural voices, you know, know, and these are just examples that are easy to pull from newspaper headlines, or I guess online newspaper headlines. Um, you know, we need Jesus and to serve to solve the climate crisis. We need Jesus and to do penance for those groups that have less power than we do, or privileges or rights. You know, we G- we need Jesus and to do good religious works or to do good community works in order to be right with God. And the funny thing is, actually, none of those things. <laughs> Are, are bad in and of themselves. It's like, you know, to take care of the earth, well, that's good. Uh, to, to try to meet the needs of others who are weaker than us, well, that's good. Uh, to do good things that the Bible tells us to, or to help out in the community, well, that's good. But that's not the point. It's not about doing good things driven by our faith in Christ. It's doing good things in addition to our faith. They have to be added in what makes us righteous before God. And so, Paul points out, you know, they're saying these things, but here's the root, right? Uh, what is that? Uh, in, in verse 12, there's, there's a root to this. You know, they may not even be able to say it themselves that this is why they're doing this, but this is a spiritual root to why people are saying Christ plus whatever it happens to be. Their hearts don't want what is best for us, but what they can get out of us. It's that age-old human problem of selfishness. Well, that's one. He does mention another one by the end of verse 12. And so here in Canada, you know, people in the name of Christ, because, you know, the newspaper's full of tons of these things, but one of the things I've been shocked about, probably over the last five years especially, is that I hear Christians on Facebook or other social media critique Christianity way more than I hear the culture do it. Sure, the culture does it as well, but I hear it like, it's not even a contest, like massive amounts from various progressive leaning churches and Christians and so-called pastors. It's just, it's all over the place. Um, These false teachers want others, you know, they want others to see how they're influencing us, what they, what they're able to point us towards, get us to do. And the second reason by the end of verse 12 is uh, the, other, the other thing that's driving them well, is that they fear the world. They don't want to be persecuted. They don't want to suffer for the cross. They fear. That's part of the driving force. They might not, you know, admit to that, but because some of these are spiritual realities that might be under their deception. And Romans chapter 1 talks about how we can be deceived by sin but they're driven by fear. Paul says, don't you realize they add to Jesus, they add to the new covenant so that they won't be persecuted by other, and you know, in the Galatians case, uh, so they won't be persecuted by other Jewish authorities. They, they want accolades, not suffering. And if you think that's bad, Paul says, it's actually, there's an even worse reason You should not be listening or being influenced by these false teachers that have apparently got you captive. Verse 13, they they are the prime example of do as I say, not as I do. 
They can't do what they say. You can't do what they say. No one can do what they say. And we heard very clearly last in the last sermon, Jesus was born under the law because he is the only one that actually could follow the law. He's the only one. I barely am able to swing my legs down from bed in the morning and touch that carpet before my first sin. It's ridiculous being a human being. We can't follow the law. We break it almost every minute of the day. No one could do what they ask, but they don't care. Again, from the spiritual perspective, because it's not like they're like, ha, ha, ha. They're, you know, I'm taking them to hell with me. No, like, they're not thinking that. They're deceived. But Paul is highlighting the roots of these things, right? These are the spiritual roots of these things, you know, and, and they just want to make you as, as much of a part of hell as they are. You know, just like in Romans chapter 1, they want people to approve of them and to do exactly what they know to be wrong. The more I can get to do what I do, well, I, you know, oh, the approval. Our, our human hearts love that. The sinfulness side of us, we love approval. Sadly, we, without the power of the Holy Spirit, we don't actually seek the only thing that can give us approval that satisfies from the Lord through Jesus Christ. So Paul, Paul uses the, the selfish perspective. You know, they just want to use you for accolades. They, you know, they can't even do what they've asked. They're afraid of being punished themselves. So the more they get you to do what they want, well, that, that'll kind of act as a protector for them. And so Paul uses all of this selfish, godless boasting and bragging to compare with how God's people actually should be acting. Verse 14, and I'll read it out again. You know, but far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You know, Paul says, uh, you know me, right, to the Galatians, you know me, because he's been with them. They, he's lived life with them. They've healed him from a great sickness. You know me. You know what I teach. And the only thing I want to boast in is in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's an incredibly beautiful verse incredibly beautiful verse that that's the only thing that any of us here should boast in So what does God really want us to get excited about? Verse 15. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. It's a very short verse. So Paul again is saying, Galatians, are you paying attention? The time for, for caring about, you know, the law and the circumcision, all these things that you need to accomplish or, or, or have physically around you, wearing the right clothes that are cut in the right way, made of the right cloth, you know, all of that stuff, all the circumcision rituals, you know, all the religious festivals and rites, that time's over, but also, as he says, well, why is he saying, you know, circumcision or non-circumcision, nor uncircumcision, well, it's because, you know, the majority of this church aren't Jewish, <laughs> and some of them are taking pride in, hey, we didn't need any of, of your religious rites. We didn't need the Old Testament covenant. We didn't need this. We didn't need that. No, we came to Christ with nothing. <laughs> you know, we're good. And, but there's a sense that there's pride in that, and I, and I think you, uh, 
maybe not as much at Galatians if you get this elsewhere, but you know, it's, it's actually a giving them an excuse to be like, well, I'm saved by Christ and now I can do whatever I want because it's, re- it's just this more nebulous saving. But either way, there's pride in that, pride in what you follow, the works, the circumcision, or pride in not having to rely on the works and circumcision. Paul's like, no, no, no. <laughs> Bo- both sides are just distraction. Actually, both sides are just dividing, right? We, we saw in chapter 5 that this congregation is divided and envying each other, and there's all sorts of sins and anger towards one another. It's a reason why Paul's put those, because I, I don't know if you've noticed, but when Paul lists some of these really ugly sins, I, I try to re- catch myself or remind myself, okay, Paul is writing this not to unbelievers, but to believers, right? We, you know, these are, he's writing these things, hey, stop doing this stuff, which is pretty ugly, <laughs> and, and, and live, live as you were meant to by the power of the Holy Spirit. It says the time for all that's done. Now, the only thing that God wants to us to care about, because it's the only thing that relies on the work of Christ on the cross, is that through that work that we are not able to do, we cannot save ourselves, is that now we can rely on his work and God has made us a new creation. It is Jesus' work on the cross that's made us new. And this, you know, and he says, boasting came up quite a lot, right? So this is what we should be talking about. This is what we should be boasting about. And we often talk about boasting as a negative thing. And, and I did a, a bit of reading on boasting. I actually couldn't find anywhere in Scripture where it said don't boast. Because boasting in and of itself is evil. No, there was a whole lot of scriptures of if you boast about your riches, you boast about your power, your strength, uh, you know, boast because you think you're wise, be- you know, all of this stuff. Well, that's bad. Why? Because you're boasting about you or the world or what you rely on. Uh, but then you've got this counter, right? Um, instead, boast about the cross. Boast about what has saved you. Boast about the only thing that could save anyone. You know, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, boast about this, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, which is why we can boast, because it has nothing to do with us. It's kind of humbling, which is part of the point, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift from God, because there's no way you could do it on your own. You needed God in order to be saved. So it is a gift from God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, no one may boast in themselves. No one can say that, well, part of my work was involved to get me to Christ. Yeah, you can't boast about that. <laughs> but you can boast that God has saved a wretch like me. Uh, you know, another song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. Well, he washed it white as snow. Verse 16. The results of being a new creation in Christ. What are the results? And, and as for all who walk by this rule, walk, walk as the new creation. Walk as people who boast in the work of the cross and not of themselves. You know, from, you know, For those who walk by this rule, well then, peace and mercy, meaning God's peace, God's mercy will be upon you and upon the Israel of God. And and that's just talking about, uh, back to uh, Jeremiah 9, speaks about that. uh, Jeremiah 9 is talking about some of those boasting, that's actually where it's referencing the riches and, and wisdom and whatnot, and and, Paul, and God says, I, you know, I want those who are circumcised of heart. Because <laughs> he lists a whole bunch of pagan nations he's going to judge. And he also ish- mentions Judah. And he mentions Israel. And talking about how they're circumcised on the outside, but their hearts <laughs> are wicked and corrupt. And so uh, it is for those who are circumcised on the inside in the heart, because God has transformed you. That's the key, right? And so, to those people, grace, or peace, sorry, peace and mercy be upon you and upon the Israel of God, the true Israel God, 
those who are not circumcised outwardly, but are circumcised inwardly. It's not the knife of a man at your eighth day, but it's the Holy Spirit who has taken a dead heart and made it alive. And then his closing verses, verse 17 and 18, uh, I'll actually read it from him instead of my summary. From now on, it's a great way to close. From now on, let no one cause me trouble. Because <laughs> he's, again, remember, he's not talking to a nebulous group of people. <laughs> Everyone who's reading, or a lot of people who's reading this, are picturing Paul because he's been with them and been in the trenches with them. So from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. I carry the physical proof that I have not compromised the truth. Now the false teachers, this kind of this is insinuated, right? Uh, you know, the false teachers you follow or you've started to follow, the ones who have tricked you, the ones who have pulled you to another gospel, you know, the ones who fear the world, the ones who want to boast about what they've gotten you to do. Those who are focused on earthly rewards, how have they paid for the truth? The cost of the gospel could be seen on Paul's body. Do we see the cost of the gospel here in Canada? I know when we look around at various churches and their pastors, and, and it really does ache my heart, because <laughs> you know some of them. Some of them are personal. You're like, I really like him. I really like her. And they're, they're pulling people away from the gospel, and it, 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 it's, it's aching. You know, uh, when we look at these various churches and the gospels, we, we got to think about this, right? You know, are they tripping over themselves to soften the gospel? Do they explain away the necessity of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins? There, there, there is only one way to get to God, and you don't get to have a part in it. <laughs> All the work you have is tainted and evil and corrupt, and uh, it will not get you to God. It just actually will get you judged more. Because you'll be saying, hey, I'm doing all of this good stuff. This will get me to heaven. And so you're actually asking, can the God of the universe who's created you, who is the holy, 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 judge you, you know, just focus on you even more about what you've done? That's not a good plan. <laughs> Do they explain with the necessity of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins? Do they encourage different works or ways to submit or ask us to continually pay penance, which seems to be in vogue the last few years, to pay penance to some kind of whatever it is that's important to our culture? There's a number of things today. Or are they stubbornly faithful to God's word? Do they sound like they have the same message that's been preached for decades and centuries? That's a good thing. Novel teachings, it's you, you should be worried. <laughs> Do they stubbornly teach Jesus is the only way to be saved from your sins? Jesus is the only way to get right with God. Jesus is the only way to not be condemned to hell for all eternity. Does culture view their teachings as foolish, offensive? Disapprove of you because that that's where you hear the truth of God. Faithful churches and pastors, you know, they may not tickle our ears, right? But they are the words that we need, that we have to endure by the power of the Holy Spirit in order to experience verse 18 and how he closes it. And it's a common closing, but think of it, this can only be experienced if you are saved. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Let it be so. So what are some takeaways? Well, one, what can happen to the Galatians can easily happen to us, right? Because the Galatians started well, but they fell, they fell to the wayside. Well, life gets hard sometimes, right? Like, 
you know, unexpected things happen, and I, I realize that, yeah, unexpected things happen to me too um, recently. <laughs> Anyways, but, you know, l- our lives don't go as we expect. This isn't fair. Why did they have to die? Why do they have cancer? And, and we start to maybe trust God a little less because we're wounded, we're hurt, we're struggling. We maybe rely on God less, which is a dangerous response to difficult times in our lives because then that leaves us responsible, not responsible, vulnerable to those who wish to pull us away from the gospel, right? Now, this isn't easy. Again, this is all by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul says, Galatians 3, 4, did you suffer so many things in vain? Did, are you going to suffer so many things in your lives, have suffered already so many things in your lives, is it just going to be in vain? Because you start to, I guess, maybe give up on God instead of turning to Him? Uh, It was interesting. I was in the auto shop a couple days ago, and, uh, uh, you know, it's just chit-chat that happens, right? You know, I'm there because I don't have a choice. I'm waiting for a van that doesn't drive. Um, And so we're, we're going on. And he's like, oh, hey, uh, you know, on a vacation? I'm like, oh, no, no, I, I'm actually on my way, if we could get there, um, uh, on our way to a conference, and then we're going to have a few days afterwards, because uh, my wife grew up here, and we're going to spend a little time in the area. Uh, she's going to show us the stuff, the sites. Um, and he's like, oh, what kind of conference? And, uh, and I said, oh, well, it's, uh, it's, it's a church and Bible conference. And he's like, oh, well, I guess God's not with you uh, today, is he? <laughs> and... And, and I'll, I'll thank, I didn't go deeper than my response, but I'll thank God for my response. I was like, well, to be honest, if God was only with me in the good times, I don't think I would really need God. I'm glad he's there in the hard times. I need God in the hard times. And, and that was just kind of where it was left. We didn't get deeper into it. But isn't that true? Like, do you really only need God in the hard times? Or I mean, in the easy times. Because the Galatians were tempted to fall away because they, they suffered. You are going to be tempted to fall away because you will, not might, you will suffer. And it's not even that suffering, like often we could deal with our own. Sometimes people will respond with great anger over their own, but really what gets people is when their loved one <laughs> suffers. God, how, how dare you let this happen? I'm sorry, God promises we're going to suffer. And as we heard, I think, two sermons ago, and it's through that suffering that actually God brings to life the gospel. Shows how God can walk through life with us, with you. And as God walks through life with you when it is really bad, remember those people who God has put around you that only you have that particular influence on, your particular group of people that by God's providence are with you? God's going to use your suffering and your response to trusting God and watching the gospel live through you, and that's going to draw some people to God, to the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. So I'm going long, so I'm skipping that. All right. You know what? Uh, here, let's go with this last one because it can be hard because this happens to our friends, uh, people we've gone to church with for years. Uh, our sons and daughters, don't be surprised when some of those who profess Christ fall away. Or don't be surprised on the other side when some of those who profess Christ become wolves in sheep's clothing, which is hard when it actually is someone that we really, really care about. You know, 1 John 2.19, that very common verse, we're aware of, you know, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might be plain that, they're, uh, that they all are not of us. And you, know, you, you can read that dispassionately, but what that means is that John had discipled and cared for people, led people to Christ, and maybe even put some of them in, in leadership, but they lasted for a while, and they're like, you know what, forget this. Jesus is, I thought Jesus was great. He's garbage. I'm done. I'm, I'm going my own way. And 
And then you have that ripping of relationship, as many of us have experienced, right? These are not dispassionate verses because they're written by real people who have seen people walk away or seen people become wolves in sheep's clothing. Oh. And so either they leave or they try to lead us astray. Don't, rem- don't forget what Paul says again to the Galatians, verse 1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Don't give up your freedom, right? Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Don't go back to what you know you were enslaved to before. Verse 7, you're running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? So, in closing, trust in the cross. Boast in the cross. And never add to Jesus' work on the cross. And then it will be able to be said of you, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. And so I've requested a song from the music team, if you'll please uh, come up. If we have clarity and if we have passion for the gospel, then let's sing out that passion that I started with from John Newton, right? Amazing grace, oh, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see.